Good morning. We wanted to meet today to share a unified message on the importance of protecting you and your loved ones against COVID-19 and update how our hospitals and cities are dealing with the pandemic. The hol holiday season is a joyous time. However, we know there are a lot of people continuing to be affected as a result of the pandemic with illness or loss of loved ones. Let's also remember those lives lost and affected by the recent storms in Arkansas to Kentucky and those providing care in those areas. Locally, we continue to see high, a high number of COVID cases. Our hospitals continue to have a very high census we continue to strive to provide quality care as close to home as possible. Since August, on average, 10 to 20% of our inpatients are actively isolated and ill with COVID. An additional 10 to 20% are recovering from COVID and not well enough to leave the hospital. An additional 10% have come to the hospital for various needs and due to staffing issues across the upper Midwest cannot uh, transition to a nursing home or assisted living so they remain in the hospital. To clarify state numbers, our adult ICU capacity at Sanford is less than 10% on a daily basis. The state numbers reported and are working with the state. We also include our NICU or neonatal intensive care unit in addition to our pediatric intensive care unit, which are very large units uh, within the state. Some statistics across Sanford as of yesterday, 206 of 224 COVID-19 patients in Sanford Health Hospitals across our footprint are unvaccinated. 67 of 70 COVID-19 patients in the ICU in Sanford Health Hospitals are unvaccinated. 48 of the 50 COVID-19 patients in Sanford Health Hospitals on ventilators are unvaccinated. We continue to have concerns that as our hospitals fill with COVID-19 patients, we will not be able to provide prompt quality care to our patients who are coming in with other medical needs. We're not unique in this concern. We continue to be called by facilities across the upper Midwest and across the United States. Many other facilities are in very similar situations. It has been one year, I believe to the day, since vaccine uh, came, to, came to Sioux Falls, came to South Dakota. The first healthcare workers were vaccinated at Sanford Health. It was a monumental day, a day that changed our fight against COVID-19. We have come a long way since that day, but we still need help getting the message across that the vaccine with booster is your best protection against COVID-19. Vaccination clinics are continuing at Sanford in our Imaginetics building. They also continue to be distributed and provided across all Sanford facilities across the state and the upper Midwest. This Saturday until noon and the day after Christmas and the day after New Year's until noon, uh, those are Sundays, vaccine will be available at our Imaginetics in Sioux Falls, Imaginetics building in Sioux Falls. Get your booster shot, complete your vaccination series. Bring your children to get vaccinated. We provide entertainment, counseling, a safe environment for them to get vaccinated as well. It's very important. Another important uh, uh, instrument in the fight against COVID is the monoclonal antibody treatments. These treatments are proven to keep people out of the hospital and one, are one of the most important tools we have. These treatments need to take place within 10 days after a positive COVID-19 diagnosis. The earlier, the better. So we continue to ask people if you have symptoms, get tested. Uh, it is very easy to, to get that done with prompt results so we can get appropriate treatment started. Vaccines save lives. Vaccines and antibody infusions continue to be proven to keep people out of the hospital. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Basil with uh, Vera Health. Thank you, Dr. Wilde. So I'm Dave Basil with uh, Vera Health, and we have been facing many of the same challenges and situation as Sanford across our footprint. 
uh, we saw an early increase rapidly in August and September, especially after Labor Day of hospitalization cases. And then system-wide, we leveled out at around 100 patients in the hospital at any given time throughout October due to COVID. November, that increased a little bit more to about 125 at any given time. We kind of oscillated around. And now in December, we continue to push up and we're around 150 patients in the hospital at any given time, and just a slow, steady increase. Now that's still only about half the peak that we saw last year, but things are really different this year than what they were in 2020. First off, last year, it was pretty much all COVID was what we were seeing in the hospital. This year, we have so much pent up demand because there's only so long that you can go without doing the routine bread and butter things. And this time of the year, we're generally about 90% full at our hospitals anyway. And so if you put another 150 COVID patients on top of that, it stretches our capacity beyond our limits on a daily basis. Another difference that we're seeing this year is that you know, the heart attacks, the strokes, we're starting to see influenza start to make an in, inroads into our population, and those all are putting added pressures that we really didn't see last year. We've had over 7,000 hospitalizations at Avera due to COVID over the last couple of years, and 4,000 of those have been within about the last six months. And so the, even though the numbers were really low this summer, we're just back up climbing, climbing, climbing. Patients that we're seeing this year also are younger than what we saw last year. Our average age last year was close to 70 years of age. This year, especially in the unvaccinated population, which are the vast majority of our admits, are more like 50. Last year it was unusual for us to admit somebody younger than 50. This year it's very common to admit somebody in their 20s and even 30s. And we've even lost children to this illness this year. And so it's a totally different population. With Omicron coming, we're very concerned about the reports that uh, natural immunity does not respond as well to Omicron, and so that's why the vaccination and booster efforts are so important. Other ways that we're trying to increase our capacity and handle this extra load is, first and foremost, like no time ever before, we're using all 37 of our hospitals to their fullest ability across our, our footprint. And that includes sometimes even transferring patients during their hospital stay between hospitals to free up some of those more acute beds. These COVID patients, they stay longer than in other types of patients like influenza. They take a lot more intense usage of resources. They're just sick, 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 especially when they get to the ICU when there's about a 50% mortality in our ICUs on, on those patients. But it takes a long time even if they do recover. Other ways that we're trying to uh, improve our capacity is we're greatly reducing our non-urgent uh, procedures. Anything that we can put off to next spring, especially if it requires an overnight stay, we're trying to put those off to make room for all these extra patients. Additionally, we've made a large investment in wages for our employees, trying to support them both emotionally but also financially through these time periods. Um, not just the physical demands of this increased capacity, the hours that we're all having to put in, but the emotional demands during this time are just incredible. My wife, I've said before, is an ICU physician and, and she continuously has remarked that she's seen more death and suffering in this last year or two than she's seen in the 20 years of her career prior to that. It's just like nothing we've ever seen before. We so appreciate all of our frontline healthcare workers. They are true healthcare heroes. And join me you know, each and every day if you have friends, neighbors, family, and thanking them for their service and what they bring to the table each and every day. But honestly, the best gift that you can give them for Christmas is to help us control the spread of this illness. Uh, I agree with Dr. Wilde that first and foremost, a cornerstone to this is vaccination. Vaccination works, it saves lives. We see you know, 80, 90% of the people that are in the hospital right now are unvaccinated. And even in those that do get admitted that are vaccinated, it's less severe than it would be otherwise. Omicron coming, the data is showing that you need higher levels of antibody and natural immunity is not gonna be enough. And it's, primary vaccination series, probably not enough. You need to get the booster as well, so help us there. 
I also agree that probably the second most important thing is that if you have any degree of cold symptoms, stay home and get tested. Uh, positivity rates are running somewhere 15 to 25 percent right now. So if you have common cold symptoms, there's really no way to tell is this COVID or is this the common cold without getting tested. And though you may not feel that bad, you could be spreading it to others within the community who are vulnerable or who may spread it to others that are vulnerable. And so please stay home and get tested and make sure that you're doing your part to, to prevent the spread. Certainly understand and appreciate the impact, not just on healthcare workers, but the rest of our community. We all have COVID fatigue. We are all tired of hearing about this week in and, and week out, but it's not going away and it continues to increase. As you go about your holiday celebrations, keep this in mind. You know, if you haven't been vaccinated, get vaccinated. Try to keep your gatherings small through the holidays, you know, if at all possible. Try to stay mainly in vaccinated groups if at all possible. Stay home if you're sick. Get tested if you're sick. Wear masks when you're in public. This is about protecting yourself, about protecting your loved ones, about protecting your community. It's going to take an effort from all of us and we will get there. Um, but please help us through this holiday season and thank you so much for the efforts that you've already put in. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chima with the city to talk about some vaccination uh, statistics as well as uh, public health. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Basil. As I said, my name is Dr. Chima. I'm the public health director for the city of Sioux Falls. And we can't emphasize enough what has already been said, which is, Vaccinations are the way we beat this pandemic. The evidence is there, we've seen the data clearly, that if you're vaccinated, you're much more, less likely to end up in the hospital or to die from this illness. We know there have been concerns you know, raised about the vaccine, uh, but I want to show you that no vaccine has been so closely monitored as the COVID-19 vaccines that have been released since last year. More people have this, taken these vaccinations than any vaccinations ever, perhaps going back to uh, the likes of smallpox, right, which, is, which happened before most of all, many of us were born. Right? So think about it. No vaccine has been scrutinized more in, history, in, in modern history than this vaccination. So we can assure you that based on the data that has been reviewed and the billions of people that have taken this vaccine over the world, the hundreds of millions in the U.S., and the hundreds of thousands that have taken this vaccine in the state of South Dakota, that these vaccines are safe and effective. We've seen very clearly that, and, and yesterday I was looking at some recent statistics, and I saw uh, the number that points that more than 800,000 people in the United States have died from this disease. Think about it. These are people that were alive last year. 800,000 Americans have died from this illness. And these are not just numbers. Locally here in the community, uh, Minnehaha and Lincoln County, we've lost nearly 500 people from this disease since last year. So these are not just statistics that we spew out. These are actual human beings. These are lives. These are families that have been wrecked by this disease. Uh, the good news is that we are not as uh, you know, bad position as we were last year. And that's all because of the vaccine. So the, the most important message that I can pass across to all of us this morning is, as you get ready for the holiday, you know, this is the best time of the year that we all love, uh, love to celebrate with our families. Think about, have a COVID uh, uh, safety plan for your family. Think about who is coming to that holiday gathering. Think about the vaccination status. Think about uh, the crowd size and any plans. Have a plan for, for how to be safe uh, during the holiday. And remember that this continues to be an issue. So this is not something that uh, we know about it, we've heard enough about it. Every given day, we have people in the hospital. And this is the second highest surge we are seeing in this pandemic since it started last year. The only time that was worse was about, about November, December last year. So it's still very serious. It's still very much a threat. Let's, uh, let me say a few words about the booster. I know initially when the boosters were rolled out, there were certain criteria uh, you know, to guide who, who should get the booster first. But we have since progressed from uh, that uh, restricted approach to making it clear that at this point, based on the data we've seen, everyone who is eligible to get the vaccine Okay, uh, uh, particularly uh, adults, so 16 and older, 
adolescents 16 and uh, above and adults 18 and above. If you've gotten your COVID vaccinations, you are due for a booster. It's been shown clearly that over time, some of that immunity wanes, but when you get your booster shot, it restores your immunity to levels that are as high as the initial time you got the vaccination. So do not think that this is something for those that are in the nursing homes or those that are aged. Everyone, every adult that has gotten, uh, whether you got the Moderna or the Pfizer or the Janssen, you are due for a booster. If you got your Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccination uh, one shot more than two months or more ago, you are due for a booster. If you got the two-dose vaccination series six months or more ago, you are due for a booster. If you've not gotten one, please plan to get it before the holiday. It will help you protect yourself, to help protect your family, because it also decreases your risk of transmitting the disease uh, if you get your booster. Thirdly, we'd like to talk about how easy uh, we're trying to make it uh, to get the vaccine, because we recognize that with the boosters being due, uh, we don't want to start seeing lines again in clinics of people needing to get the vaccine. And that's part of why uh, early in November we announced uh, the uh, Give It A Shot to Falls, which is our city efforts to try and make it much more easy for people to get their vaccinations. So we have, you may have seen uh, some of the rap buses going around the city. And what we're doing with those is making, uh, providing mobile vaccine outreaches where, you know, we've been showing up at uh, grocery stores like Sunshine Foods. Uh, we've been showing up at some libraries and, and strategic locations across the city based on our understanding of uh, the vaccination rates locally. And we're making it easy. So we're having hours in the evening, we have on weekends because we recognize not everyone can take off work to go get vaccinated. So look at uh, the city website, cfors.org forward slash COVID-19. You'll see all uh, information about the availability of those uh, mobile clinics. But I also want to point out that we have the resources, we have the will, we are ready to do as many vaccine events as necessary to get our community vaccinated. So if you see that none of the available times of dates work for you, and you're a business or you're a big family or uh, any entity, you have a sizable number of people who are willing to get vaccinated, please call 211 or fill out a form on our website, again, cfors.org forward slash COVID-19. And we're more than happy to work with you to schedule a date and time that works for you to get uh, the, uh, the mobile, box out, mobile bus out to your location to get our uh, vaccines and arms. And I know that, uh, lastly, I know there's been a lot of talk and uh, questions about the virus. Again, there is nothing new uh, about this. This is what viruses do. Viruses mutate, okay? So as long as they're replicating in the wild, you're going to have new uh, uh, versions of the virus, some of them more potent, some uh, you know, more, uh, more aggressive. We saw that with the Delta variant that came out in the summer, it was much more aggressive than uh, the previous variant that we were dealing with. Uh, so today, Delta variant remains the most predominant variant in the U.S. It's been detected in all states in the U.S., and it's the predominant variant today. The new variant um, that is uh, kind of in the news uh, right now, there's not a lot, enough evidence to know how severe or how we might change the dynamics of the pandemic. However, early data shows that it is much more transmissible. So that means, you, uh, you know, if you get it, you're much more likely to give it to someone else. But also, even with a, a vaccination, it's more likely to spread, uh, continue spreading uh, than the previous variant. However, remember that the more than, most important things we get out of the vaccine, it's really to stop people from being uh, severely ill, going to the hospital, or dying from those diseases. So the fact that we get what some people are called breakthrough infections does not change the dynamics, does not change the fact that vaccines are how we save lives and how we keep the hospitals uh, you know, available for other diseases. So again, get your boosters. If you've not started a series, as at, as at uh, today, only about 62% of our uh, people in our community, and uh, by community I mean the two counties, Lincoln and Minnehaha County, have received at least one dose of any of the vaccines. So there's still about 38-37% 30, 30, uh, of the community who have not started the series. And remember that now we have vaccines available for all ages from five and above. So please get vaccinated, get your children vaccinated. Uh, if you've already started the series, get your boosters. And know that uh, we, have, um, we have the resources and, and the will to uh, make it easy to get the vaccines. So uh, with that, uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, but again, remember that COVID remains a threat in our community have your uh, plans uh, for how to stay safe during the holiday season. Thank you. And, you know, uh, if you have specific questions for uh, Dr. Wildey or uh, Dr. Basel or myself, we're happy to take them. Uh, um, with the vaccinations, what sort of is 
the goal for you guys with vaccinations? I know before they kind of became out, you talked about herd immunity a lot. What sort of, yeah. where are we at with that? What's the goal for vaccinations? That's a good question, right? And personally, uh, you not, uh, you know, we don't uh, pay a lot of attention or emphasis on that uh, concept of herd immunity. And the reason being that we should think about this, so think about think about this uh, in comparison to, to really understand what's going on compared to any other illness that we're used to, right? Think about the flu. The flu is probably one that we can relate most to. The flu is something that we are aware there is something called the, uh, called the flu that has a season, right? And when it gets to the flu season, what do we do? We do the best we can to protect ourselves. So we get vaccinated and then we pay attention to when we have symptoms to receive early treatment. The whole idea really is how do you prevent people from being severely ill from this illness and you know, not, not to talk about dying from it, right? So that's the most important thing you want from a, a vaccine, is to make this a mild disease where it's not a big threat, where we have to, uh, we're able to go about our normal business. Children are able to go to school, we're able to go to work, and the community is able to stay open for business. That's the most important goal is, how do we stay open for business? How do we keep our children learning? And how do we save lives? If we can have these goals achieved, I can guarantee you that you know, think about all the diseases we deal with in our community. We do not shut down the country to deal with those diseases. We manage them, and some of them, over time, may cease no longer to be a problem. So sometime in the future, COVID may no longer be a problem, but as of today, the most important goal is how do we stay open? How do we keep our hospitals available for other uh, uh, needs that we have, we need the hospital for? And how do we prevent people from dying or having severe illness from those diseases? And vaccinations absolutely can help us get there, and it's already showing it will help us get there. Uh, did you want to add anything to that? Please. Just to be more specific on that, yeah. I'm saying, you know, we say bring a pandemic to an endemic. Um, when, and that's when responsible people, right, can supposedly take off the mask and do these things. What are the specific numbers we're looking to see? Is it a vaccine, fully vaccination rate, a number of active cases reported, hospitalizations <laughs> below a certain number? Where's that? Specific bar where we can really say, you know, we can live our lives. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. So, really listening to both questions is at what point is this more endemic as opposed to pandemic? What's the role of vaccine? And in healthcare, uh, like Dr. Team was alluding to as well, we, we want people to be well. We want people to be at home, safe happy with loved ones, with family members. That's why we emphasize all vaccines. That's why we emphasize cancer screenings, things like that. Well-being, high blood pressure control, diabetes control, because we want you at home, we want you safe and healthy. And so that is really the primary goal of vaccine uh, against COVID. In terms of hospitalizations, the more that's there, the more at risk our caregivers are, the more at risk your loved ones are. And so we really want the hospitalizations to be down. We want these to be quicker hospitalizations, like Dr. Basil alluded to, with antibody infusion, with vaccination, we see a much quicker hospitalization and a return to normalcy as opposed to a prolonged hospitalization that might lead to significant uh, illness going forward, like long COVID, might lead to death, unfortunately. And so we really want those vaccine numbers, vaccination numbers up because we feel that leads to people being at home, healthy, happy with their loved ones. So in answer to the question of what's it gonna take to get the numbers to start going back down and turn this into more of an endemic rather than a pandemic situation where we can get onto your lives. One way of looking at that is by the reproduction number or the spread rate. The spread rate right now is only about 1.1 across our footprint. That means for about every 10 individuals that get COVID, they pass it to 11 other individuals. And that's why those numbers just slowly keep going up. So it's not going to take too much to change that, to drop it down. If just one or two of those 10 people pass it on to one fewer individual, that's going to mean that instead of 10 people spreading it to 11, 10 people spread it to eight or nine. And then our numbers are going to start coming down and that will snowball rapidly to where the numbers come down quickly. And that's why it doesn't take very many more people to either start getting tested when they have symptoms or to get vaccinated so they never uh, get it and spread it 
either way. Either of those two things. It doesn't take too many individuals to take that extra step before we'll start turning it around and start coming back down the other side. Um, so yesterday we had the um, largest number of hospitalizations in South Dakota since December of last year. Um, do you anticipate we're going to see more of that trend and what factors do you think might be contributing to that? Sure. So uh, the question is uh, the number of cases, active hospitalizations per the state health department data were the highest since last year at this mm -hmm. time. And what do we anticipate going forward and um, what I would the answer to that would be uh, really kind of what we just talked about is what Dr. Basil alluded to as well. If we get that number that, that if you have a case, how many people you spread it to, if we get that number turned around and we're really close to doing that, I, I think we will reach a point where the numbers come down fairly dramatically. Now, the virus in itself, as we alluded to earlier, the Omicron variant, we were dealing predominantly with the Delta variant right now, that continues to be an unknown, but we do have a lot of confidence in the vaccine and booster generated immunity and the monoclonal antibodies. So even right now, variants aside, if people work on the vaccine, getting boosted and the antibody infusions, we can turn those numbers around pretty quickly, but it takes effort. It takes people willing to know that, geez, I, I, I feel a little different. You know, it's probably nothing. Those are people we're really encouraged to get tested because you just don't know. I personally don't know, and probably speaking for these gentlemen as well, we just don't know if that's COVID or not. Get tested, stay home, stay safe, call, get tested, make sure that's not COVID so you're not spreading it to someone else. Um, with the antibody treatment, do you think that that will be Um, so the antibody treatments, uh, what, what groups are we focusing on? So those are indicated for the emergency use authorization for certain populations, and we certainly follow that emergency use authorization. It's also indicated for those at high risk who have been exposed. We're really trying to focus on those that have active COVID and are at the highest risk, but we really want anyone within that emergency use authorization to uh, look toward that. Um, in this area, compared to other areas that we see across the United States, we have good capacity and uh, are so pleased with our staff, so uh, inspired by our staff, uh, how we can staff these outpatient infusion areas literally seven days a week so we can get those uh, uh, people that are positive infused as quickly as possible. And we have uh, been able to stand those facilities up and do a nice job of getting people in and not delaying that care. Unfortunately, haven't seen that across the country just a little bit. So really anyone that fits within the emergency use authorization criteria, and we go through that screening with you when you're positive uh, to make sure we get that antibody infusion in as soon as possible. Another couple of comments about the monoclonal antibodies is that so there's several different monoclonal antibodies out there there's even a new one evashield that can be used prophylactically for immunocompromised individuals say active cancer or transplant patients that kind of helps protect them for up to six months there's also you'll probably be hearing about oral antivirals that are coming on the market that can help with this but the bottom line is these are modest improvements. They are certainly helpful, but they're not as helpful as prevention with a vaccine. We see a lot of individuals coming into the hospital and think that we have a magic bullet that if they do get sick that we can give them an antiviral monoclonal and really turn things around. These are, you know, 30% effective, 40% effective, much better as a 90% effective vaccine that's going to keep you from ever getting the illness before. So we do have more tools in our toolbox than we had a year ago, but nowhere near do we have a magic bullet, say, like for penicillin for strep throat. They're just not that good. In general terms, how concerned should people be right now in comparison to, I guess, where we were uh, when things were kind of at their peak and people were really concerned about what's going on? Are we, should we be panicking like that, or should we just be aware of what's going on? So I would say definitely uh, we should be concerned. I wouldn't use panic as a word, right? Uh, because we have the, the tools, as we pointed out. If it was last year, well, we were helpless, right? So, uh, but this year we have the tools. 
and I particularly uh, want to have a message focused on parents uh, who have young children because we know that a lot of parents who themselves are vaccinated uh, you know, I have the feeling that, oh, well, it's a child. Children are not as affected as adults. I'm not going to worry about vaccinating my children. But if you pay attention to the numbers, you'll see that uh, we're having a lot of young people who have severe illness from COVID. Some continue to suffer from long COVID, and they have, you know, uh, problems with learning and staying in school when they have long COVID. We also have a lot of young people. We have people in their 20s who have died in the state of South Dakota, some as recent as last week or last two weeks are from COVID. So this is not a disease of adults only. This affects children severely. So if you have a child at five years and above, uh, uh, like myself, you know, I was very grateful when there was a vaccine for children because it just means my youngest just got eligible and uh, uh, were able to get him to get vaccinated as quickly as, as it uh, became eligible. So I encourage you parents uh, that have school age children, uh, please take advantage of this new approval for young children, get your children vaccinated. And again, back to your question about should we be concerned, I would say absolutely we should be very concerned. If you look at the numbers, uh, the, the number of people in the hospital continues to be high. The transmission rate continues to be high. Uh, we need to be very careful going to the holiday to see that, you know, everyone that goes into the holiday emerges safely and healthy and happy into the new year. So please, but again, we have the right tools. Uh, be, be mindful when you plan for your holiday trips and your holiday gatherings. Get vaccinated and when in a crowd, like a grocery store or in a public setting, uh, please wear your mask. That will also help reduce the community transmission. Thank you. Yeah, so, so it's a clear, the message is clear just to get vaccinated is the best way to get done with this thing. Yet the message seems to be the same as far as the way in which we're encouraging. Is there a new tactic for trying to get people who previously just still aren't interested? Like, is there a new message we're trying to approach them? Right, so how do we talk to individuals to encourage and increase the rates of vaccination? I kind of look at it just like quitting smoking or something else. You never know when an individual is going to be receptive to that I idea, and you've got to kind of keep understanding where they're at, what their concerns are, trying to address their concerns, trying to fight the misinformation that's out there. Sometimes that involves telling the stories. We certainly have had individuals that have been unvaccinated, been hospitalized, that have been telling their stories. That's often very powerful uh, to get those personal experiences out there and the regrets in some of those individuals that have been hospitalized that were unvaccinated. That's certainly very powerful. We've actually seen an increase in rates with Omicron. People are recognizing that this is changing the ball game quite a bit and that you've got to get those antibody levels up higher. I think that's also going to help with the understanding there's a lot of individuals up there that felt that they were protected by natural immunity. And I think with the report coming out now that natural immunity is not enough, especially for Omicron, that's upping the increase in those individuals saying, well, we thought this pandemic was about over and I could get by without getting vaccinated. It looks like that's not going to be the case. So I better, you know, bite the bullet and go ahead and get vaccinated. So all of those sorts of things, you keep working on on increasing that and we're making progress and like I said earlier it's not going to take too many more individuals to get vaccinated or to get tested that previously weren't getting tested this isn't a overwhelming number of individuals that we have to have to get something different on a very small change is going to change the trajectory of this illness and, and I'd like to emphasize as uh, Dr. Basso said that we are making progress and I, I think it's important to capture that uh, that view as well, to recognize that we are indeed making progress. So about a few months ago, late June, our vaccination rate was at 47.5% in late June. And today it's about 62.2% of you know, people in both counties have become vaccinated. That's about 29% increase uh, since late June. So we're having people who haven't started the series, who in the last uh, few months, uh, the last four months, have made that decision to go ahead and get a series started. So we are making progress. We just need more people to uh, you know, keep making that decision and keep moving us in that direction uh, to get the vaccination rates higher uh, than where it is today. But we are making progress and we can get uh, to much more higher levels. So the question, to repeat the question is, uh, and uh, are, we, uh, are we near a level where we're going to need mandates to, to get vaccination? Is that a question? Yeah. And so to be clear about, so the word mandate is something that, you know, gets used a lot in this pandemic, right? Whether it's shutdown, whether it's mask, whether it's vaccine. 
And I think it's important to pay attention to the real to the real goal here. The real goal here is how do we get majority of people in our community understand the need for this and why we need to uh, uh, take certain action. So I'll rather focus on the goal, which is how do we get more people vaccinated? There are so many ways to get to that goal. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, mandates uh, is one tool that some places might choose to use. But here, I think we will think about pragmatic solutions, right? It's really about getting people to understand what is at stake, which I think, you know, health system partners, uh, the city and uh, different agencies in the community have been doing a good job at trying to get that message across. Because there's nothing more powerful than when people buy in and recognize why they have to do something than when you feel they feel they're being coerced to do that. So I think it's important to stay focused on the goal, which is how do we get our community to understand we're in this together and we can all be better when, uh, when we beat this disease. clinics and that kind of thing, uh, having enough workers and beds in, in their, their systems. Are we seeing that uh, now? How are those rural health systems, those rural uh, satellite locations doing anyway? Yeah, so the question is really around uh, rural facilities, basically outside of Sioux Falls, how they're doing from a staffing care standpoint. Um, they have been incredible partners. Um, caring for the people of the upper Midwest of South Dakota throughout the pandemic, we've all been in this together. We communicate several times daily. We've been sharing best practices back and forth. They're in very unique situations um, and, and we're all learning from each other. Um, there has been inspiring stories from staff out there. They're available 24 seven, the care they're providing. Um, really amazing uh, work that's being done. They also have been working incredibly hard while they don't have the population necessarily to draw from to get the, all the staff. They've been uh, increasing uh, rates, providing uh, inspiration, providing wellness, well-being programs like all of us have to keep that staff uh, energized, engaged, and safe so we can provide that care to people as close to home as possible. It continues to be challenging, and that's frankly one of the reasons why we're here today is uh, really to value everyone in healthcare that's trying to get the job done and get people taken care of uh, as safe to home as possible. So nothing but appreciation for really any, anyone in healthcare. And uh, there's some unique struggles out there, but there's really some amazing people facing those challenges. At Avera, our rural facilities continue to face those same staffing challenges. If you think about some of our smaller hospitals, you know, in the entire county, there may be eight or 10 nurses total in that county, and we already employ all of them. And so if case numbers increase, or if we have a couple nurses who are out with COVID or because of exposure to COVID, there are no other nurses in the county that we can, you know, lean on to bring in. And so it's a very limited workforce. And so all of our rural facilities, you know, I've never really seen sustained number of hospitalizations like this for the last 20 years and they're adapting. We continue to support them similarly, you know, emotionally, financially, um, in any way that we can to help get through this. And they just are doing a remarkable job, but it is probably the biggest challenge at all of our facilities right now. Um, you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but where are the healthcare systems right now in terms of um, like elective surgeries and being postponed or yeah, so uh, Avera is deferring uh, non-urgent uh, procedures, especially that require an overnight stay. Uh, we just don't have the beds at this individual's, and so if they are uh, procedures that can wait until next spring without any consequences, then we absolutely are doing that to free up the beds and the staff for the COVID individuals at this point. At Sanford and Sioux Falls, uh, we continue with all of our uh, surgeries, watching that on a daily basis. We're working uh, with our staff really at all hours uh, to assure that we can be there uh, for them. And we've been able to continue with our uh, current schedule as it is. Uh, for both health systems with uh, cases rising nationally, are you getting any requests to bring in patients from out of state to care for them? And if so, are you taking so the question is um, around 
are we receiving requests for, requests from around uh, other facilities we typically don't I, I add some words here but we typically don't hear from to uh, accept patients and we are um, as I think since December 7th at Sanford Sioux Falls we received 85 requests from across the United States we've been able to accommodate some of those and some of those we we simply cannot um, and they are coming from all over and it is for care whether it's COVID or not about half of those have been COVID related um, as you look across the United States and go uh, on the CDC website you can see where COVID is um, a little higher right now versus not but it, it tends to move around and uh, facilities just continue to be challenged and we're all working together to try to accommodate that care as close to home as possible um, i have a question for both my systems um, so minnesota officials um, in the hospital systems across the state have had to publish a full page ad in newspapers um, about how overwhelming strain has been on their healthcare system. Um, could you speak to maybe um, that overall, if, if that is also the case for over in Sanford? So the question about uh, Minnesota, many of the health systems joined together here recently to have a full page ad helping to educate the public on the scope of hospitalizations and the impact that was having on the healthcare workforce and whether something like that would be considered here as well. I would say we're open to any and all opportunities we have to have a dialogue with the, dis with the public about what we are facing on a daily basis. And we are facing you know, considerable capacity strains in the hospital due to, due to COVID. And, and certainly discussions like we're having today to try to get that word out, I'd say any type of modality that we can have that so that the public is well informed and understands what's going on in their state is a good thing. Yeah, I would just add uh, from a Sanford standpoint, reading that statement is, you know, certainly there's some really good points and points made here. I, I think it's important, though, to stress an honest conversation about where we're at and uh, the challenges we're facing, but at the same time, the positivity that's out there. There's some language that, you know, I, I think it's more important to focus on the positive, and that is there's a lot of people out there that have done some really amazing things, and that is around greater than half of South Dakotans being vaccinated, people receiving the monoclonal antibody infusions, people taking the steps to get themselves taken care of, whether it's from a COVID or just mental health or any other health standpoint. Um, there's really nice work being done. There's other people that are kind of on the fence and trying to make those decisions, and that's what we're here for, is to talk about that and uh, to provide that space and information to see where we're at so they can also help make that informed decision. So really want to be in a, in a positive sense to move people on to, again, as I stated before, keeping people at home healthy, safe with their families. When it comes to masks, is the message just in public when you're not sure of people's vaccination status, or what sort of is the message for masking? So the question is, what is the current message for masking? And the point remains, uh, we, have, we still have a high transmission rate uh, in Lincoln and Minnehaha County. And the guideline uh, from the CDC remains that, you know, when we have a substantial or high transmission rate, it is, you know, strongly recommended, generally advisable to wear a mask in a crowded setting. And that, uh, particularly if you're indoors, right? It's a different thing if you're out in the park where there's a lot of natural flowing fresh air, right? But anytime you're in a crowded setting, whether it's a religious congregation, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's a big family gathering, right? The chance that one person in that gathering is uh, infected it's, it's just there, right? Because the community transmission is very high. So what, what masking does really is to reduce the likelihood that if one person in a crowd is infected, that it doesn't become you know, a super spreader event. So think about it from that way. Again, go back to, let's stop thinking about mandates and no mandates. Think about what can we do to save lives? What can we do to stay safe this holiday? So when we talk about having a holiday, you know, if an emergency is coming, right? When the snow is coming, uh, when the snowstorm was coming, we had you, know, you have your emergency plan, right? How am I going to navigate? Do I need to take off work? What's the plan? How do I stay safe through the day? The same thing. Think about the holiday. How do we stay safe? If you have family coming over, do you know their status? Do we people need to get tested? 
uh, do we need to have plans for masks when we're indoors? Or should we have the event outdoors if the weather permits, right? The same. So the, ma the message is when you're in a crowded place indoors, okay, consider wearing a mask. It, it helps to reduce the, the transmission.